This lecture is about hunger. It's also a little bit about homeostasis, about nutrition, and of course, the brain mechanisms involved and the body's mechanisms involved. So homeostasis is an internal balancing state. We have to keep a steady state of many aspects of your body, nutrition, water, food, oxygen, of course. And there's these feedback loops that help us to keep that mechanism um, in a steady state. Now, we're going to talk about homeostasis a lot when we talk about um, food, about keeping a nice balance in our body and how the body regulates that and monitors that. And we'll also talk about how that stops, how we get what's called a feedback inhibition, which means there's enough of this nutrition, I need to stop having the motivation to seek it out. So what do we have as homeostatic mechanisms in our body? Of course, oxygen is probably the number one. We have mechanisms for determining when we're low on oxygen. No oxygen, we're not going to get cellular respiration, we're not going to produce ATP, and of course the cells aren't going to work and they're going to die very quickly. But we also have homeostatic me mechanisms for temperature, water, salt, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, hormones, vitamins, a lot of things. We monitor those systems really at a subconscious level, but we have monitoring stations around our body that look to see, do we have enough water? Do we have enough salt? Do we have enough sugar? And there's these mechanisms to bring those levels up or bring those levels down to keep yourself at a balanced state, homeostasis. So we have these detectors. We have, for example, water detectors in our brain, in several aspects of our brain, this um, osmo detectors uh, in our hypothalamus. We also have osmo detectors in our kidney. Uh, we have salt detectors, we have uh, sugar detectors, and then of course the detectors have to have a way to correct when we are out of balance. Now that can have a lot to do with the physiology of your body, changing the physiology to accommodate those changes, or it can have a lot to do with motivation. If you're low on water, you're going to be doing a lot of things, for example, in your kidney to keep fluids back in your system, but you're also going to have the motivation of thirst and to seek out water. So one of the main areas of the brain that is responsible for detecting, monitoring, doing something about these homeostatic states is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is really towards the ventral portion of your brain. It's deep down in your brain. We have all these different, what we call nuclei, um, areas in the hypothalamus. They're gonna feed information down here to the pituitary, the anterior and posterior pituitary. We're gonna go through and look at a lot of these different nuclei in the hypothalamus and some of their roles. The lateral hypothalamus, uh, has a lot to do with hunger. The ventral medial hypothalamus has a lot to do with when you're full. The suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is uh, up here. We're going to talk about these nuclei in different lectures as well. So here is the feedback loop that I was talking about. The brain detects levels of sugar and water and salts. The hypothalamus has detectors for these things. If those things are low, we get an afferent, e exit, an afferent information down to the digestive system to do something about it. And then it might afferently send signals back up to the brain to say, we have regulated this system. We've gotten it back to balance. This constant feedback. Here's one example. Let's take glucose, sugar. We have to keep sugar levels balanced in our body because we use sugars, glucose, for cellular respiration to produce ATP, and ATP is used everywhere. So we have to keep that kind of balance. You may have heard of somebody being hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic. These are terms to refer to low levels or high levels of sugar. And if somebody is hypoglycemic, they can be in a lot of trouble very quickly. So let's say there's detectors, and there are in the hypothalamus, that are detecting glucose levels. If the glucose levels are low, they send information down to the liver. The liver is a storage place for glucose. 
that glucose is then released into the blood system, in, into the arteries and the veins, and the arteries are taking that information eventually up into past the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is now detecting that there's enough glucose and will shut down the system, will inhibit the system. Maybe there's a lot of glucose. Maybe you just ate a giant candy bar and the system is going to the hypothalamus is going to tell the system down here, your pancreas and your liver, store glucose. There's too much glucose in the system, store it up. And that's going to be reduce the glucose levels in the circulatory system, this constant feedback loop. So let's talk about food a little bit. We hear these terms all the time, calories or kilocalories. Um, this is operationally defined as simply the energy released from the food that is needed to increase one, uh, one gram of water up one degree Celsius. It's just an operationally defined thing. When you burn these calories, this is how it's defined. Um, what's also very important to understand, we'll talk about this later, is the idea of how we burn calories. Um, we burn calories, we take calories in, it's really just a balance there. If you take more calories in than you, you are burning, you will put on weight and vice versa. Men need, uh, depending on their size, uh, close to 3,000 calories a day, women close to 2,000 calories a day. Again, it depends on the size and the activity. Um, for example, I remember hearing the Olympic, uh, Olympic swimmers can oftentimes use 8,000, 9,000 calories a day. But of course, they're swimming eight hours a day, so it balances out. So let's look a, a little bit about the types of food we take in. Of course, there's carbohydrates. These are the sugars. These can be simple sugars like fructose um, and sucrose and glucose. There are several others. These can be comp more complex sugars. Um, as an example, glycogen. We take these in, we break them up, we take them into our cells, and we use them to convert uh, ATP, ADP into ATP, cellular respiration, very important for energy. Um, lipids are good storage of energy, especially for the body outside the brain. The brain primarily uses glucose and sugars, simple sugars, for conversion, conversion into energy. Fats can be used in the rest of the body. It's one of the reasons, though, that People need to take in carbohydrates. They cannot, if there's somebody who's very big, they can't just live off their fat stores. They have to take in fresh glucose, fresh sugars. And of course, proteins, these make up the enzymes, the fibers, the building blocks. You know, proteins can be used for energy, but you're going to be in a lot of trouble when you start breaking down proteins for energy. Okay, here's a slide I'd like you to know a little bit about. If you have a lot of glucose, you've taken in a lot of simple sugars, insulin is going to do many things with those simple sugars. It's going to help those sugars get into the cells for cellular respiration. It's going to help those uh, sugars uh, get out of the small intestine. But if you have a lot, it's going to want to store those simple sugars. Insulin is going to help convert glucose into glycogen. Glycogen is a storage of glucose. But if you're going to need that glycogen, you don't have enough sugar. Once things have to keep in balance, you're going to convert your storage of glycogen into glucose, and you're going to use a hormone called glucagon. So glucose is converted into glycogen with insulin and glycogen into uh, with the help of glucagon into glucose. We're going to talk about insulin in the coming slides. So here's some of the ways that we use up calories. We burn calories. Just at rest, we have a resting metabolism. A resting metabolism can change, though, depending on exercise levels, depending on whether you've just fasted a lot, you, you've gone without food for a while. There is just what's called the thermic effect, which is the energy needed to digest food. And, of course, physical activity. More physical activity, more calories you're going to burn, okay? And um, there's a lot of websites you can go out to to find out how many calories you burn for walking or running or bicycling. And weight gain and weight loss is best understood as calories in and calories used. It really comes down to that. Now, there's a lot of other things that might facilitate those um, factors, metabolism, the types of food you eat, but it really does come down 
to just food in, food used. And so there's a lot of hype about these fancy diets and um, fancy diets can be kind of destructive. Um, and the best way to, to monitor weight is really to know how many calories you're taking in and how many calories you're burning. If you like eating a lot, all you have to do is exercise more. Okay, so here's something um, that we get back into a little bit of the physiology. There's an idea about the set point. Um, it's called the glucostatic hypothesis. It's an idea that we monitor our glucose levels. And when glucose levels get low, we balance that out, again, with things like the muscles and the liver, but also you get a motivation to eat glucose or eat sugars or eat food when your glucose levels are low. This is glucose privation, deprivation of glucose. So eating, you get hungry when your glucose levels drop. And what monitors that are these glucose detectors. And there's these glucose detectors in your lateral hypothalamus. Your lateral hypothalamus is saying there's low, you have a low on glucose, you're going to start feeling hungry, have motivating motivations to eat. If you destroy these cells in, for example, a laboratory animal, the animal doesn't have a lot of motivation to eat, doesn't eat a lot of food. Now, this tells us a little bit about crash diets. Let, um, there's a lot of, of ads out there where you lose weight quickly. I mean, nobody ever sells ads for a diet where they say, you will lose 10 pounds over the next three months or six months, which is probably the healthy way to lose it. And so there's this idea that not only do we have a glucose set point, but there might also be a lipo set point, a lipostatic theory, a fat set point. So here's kind of what happens. Somebody puts you on a diet where you eat very few calories, you take things that suppress your appetite, and you lose weight quickly. Okay? It's a crash diet. And you feel really good about yourself because it's been two weeks and you've lost 10 pounds and you're, this is great. This diet really works. There's a lot of things going on in your body that are trying to get you back up to a set point. The body doesn't know you're on a crash diet. The body thinks you're still a I don't know, still a, a, an Australopithecus on the Serengeti, and you've just started starving to death. So there's some things that happen that change, that motivate that weight to come back. The body doesn't like to lose weight quickly. When you go back to a normal diet, you're going to start binding up those that glucose. You're going to start um, uh, converting that glycogen into fat, and there's going to be all these pressures to get back up into set point. And even though you eat a normal diet, there's still that push to get you back. And that has a lot to do with your regulation of glucose and your resting metabolism. And one of the most common things to happen when you lose weight quickly is to gain it back and actually to overshoot a little bit, okay? The best way to gain weight is to lose weight quickly. It seems kind of silly. Now, one somebody who loses weight quickly says that diet really worked, it must be something wrong with me. Diets that where you lose weight quickly have a lot of problems and can oftentimes overshoot. The best thing to do is to lose weight slowly. Not as fun, but maybe a pound a week is a good estimation because then you can adjust, you can adjust that set point, just like it would adjust the set point if you gain that weight back up and it would be very difficult. So here's a little study about that. The body guards against weight loss. It thinks you're starving. So Elliot, 1989, measured resting uh, metabolic rate of obese women before, during, and after dieting. When women lost weight, their resting met metabolic rate also decreased, reducing calorie burning and influenced weight gain. Okay? There's a lot of studies that have been coming out lately about the, really the dangers of losing weight quickly. doesn't mean uh, people shouldn't be losing weight. It depends on how they do it. Calories in, calories burned. So what starts a meal? What motivates you to start a meal? Well, there's a lot of things that go on. Um, high fructose, high sugars, high fats. We call this the hedonic pleasure of food, the, the pleasure of food, every, mm, the taste of, of cheeseburgers and bacon and all those things um, can, can start the process of digestion. Now, when you smell food, when you taste food, you have an increase in response. You have a lot of salivation, you have gastric juices, but you also increase insulin, even before you eat it. 
and insulin will bind glucose up into glycogen. There's less glucose. The hi lateral hypothalamus detects the low glucose, and you really start getting hungry. Okay, we've all experienced that. Come home, smell really good food cooking, then you start getting hungry. Well, that's a physiological response as well. So as you increase these autonomic response functions, you're going to start increasing food. Okay, so the smell of food, the sight of food, food comes in through the eyes. It starts that digestive process. Has anybody ever gone into Kentucky Fried Chicken, smelled it, left, and ate nothing? Oh, of course not. You're going to take that food in. So what stops a meal? There's a lot of things that, that help to stop a meal. Your stomach can expand. There are detectors around your stomach. When your stomach expands, it's sending signals back up to your brain. There's a lot of food in there. The ventromedial hypothalamus also has glucose detectors. And if there's a lot of glucose... The ventral medial hypothalamus is going to send information to the rest of the brain saying you've had enough food. There's enough food you should stop eating. If you lesion the ventral medial hypothalamus, for example, in a rat, this animal takes in a lot of carbohydrates, will become a very large rat, a very fat rat with a lesion ventral medial hypothalamus. Ventral medial hypothalamus may affect insulin release. There's also a couple of hormones. I thought we would talk about a few of them. One is called cholecystokinin, CCK. This is released from the small intestine and it regulates how much food is um, taken from the stomach into the small intestine. Uh, if you inject an animal with CCK, they stopped eating. It acts as kind of a second messenger system up to the brain. I am taking a lot of food from the stomach into the small intestine. You must have a lot of food. This can act as sort of an appetite suppressant. There's another uh, hormone called um, peptide YY or PYY. These are also um, affected by how much you eat coming from the digestive system, going up to the brain. There are receptors in the brain detect this hormone, tells you to stop eating. So insulin, we've talked about insulin. Insulin is released from the pancreas and uh, permit permits organs other than the brain to metabolize glucose, helps glucose gets into cells. Brain has insulin detectors. Infusion of insulin into the brain, an area into the brain called the third ventricle of the brain, can cause, uh, can inhibit eating. There's lots of insulin, there must be a lot of food, and cause weight loss in, in animals. Insulin can be a kind of a dangerous thing though. Let's talk a little bit about obesity. It's been in the news quite a lot and there's some supplements to uh, in your in the modules uh, to to look at about this uh, and obesity is one of those problems that is growing exponentially in America in the world and here I, I was trying to give this some thought and the idea is one we're eating a tremendous amount of sugar our sugar intake has gone up. Well, the sizes of our food have a lot to do with what we're eating. We're eating a lot more fats, a lot more other things. But look at how much sugar is in these types of sodas. People buy these sodas now. They rarely buy these kinds. What about big gulps? Look at this poor kid eating, drinking a big gulp. That's a tremendous amount of sugar for such a small body. But I was also given some thought about where else I'm, I, we get sugar. Um, these are sugary cereals. The primary ingredient, the first ingredient on these sugar cereals um, that kids are eating, you know, these are the primary ingredients is sugar and sugar and colorants and something that keeps sugar together in a, in a, in a clump. Um, so these are all the ones I was thinking about. You know, this is the one we, I had when I was a kid called Freakies. Who feeds their child Freakies, honestly? But this was, it was a delicious sugary cereal. And I was also thinking, you know, it's, it really starts in October, in Halloween, the tremendous amount of sugar that we eat at Halloween and that we feed our kids. They walk around house to house and they get pounds and pounds of sugar. And just when that sugar is run out, just when they've gorged themselves, we go on to the next holiday. Okay, so three weeks later, we're eating all these sugars at Thanksgiving, these giant meals at Thanksgiving. And then, of course... Christmas and Hanukkah and other events come in, in, in December and we're just going to parties and we're eating and sugar, sugar, sugar. You know, who wants to get a box of broccoli as a gift for Christmas? No, it's of course, it's a box of sh sugary candy. Delicious. 
this is a tremendous amount of sugar that we're eating. Right after that, we got February, we got Valentine's Day. Got to give your sweetheart sweets. Plenty of that. And then right around there, we have Easter. And of course, Easter, there are the, the, the peeps and the jelly beans and all these things. I'm not saying these things aren't delicious, but oh my gosh, that's a tremendous amount of sugar in six months. And if you look, here's an interesting graph, 1822 to 2005, we are not set up to eat this type of sugar. Human beings through our evolution did not eat this much sugar. This type of sugar is rare in our natural environment. And so we have these receptors in our brain and in our taste buds that say, yes, oh, get that sugar. That's so rare. Get that. You need that for energy. But now it's abundant. And so we go from this is a pounds per year per person of sugar. You know, maybe people ate eight pounds of sugar in a whole year, 150 years ago. Now we're eating 100, 120 pounds of sugar. Our small, our, 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 um, pancreas isn't set up for that our body isn't set up for that and we get from that a tremendous weight gain as a as a country so here's one way that we measure um, obesity levels we have the bmi the body mass index and this is your weight divided by your height and that gives you a bmi score so you can look here and you can go, okay, here's my weight. I come over, here's my height. And that should be my BM, um, BMI score for um, uh, underweight, normal weight, and then obese. And the body index score, you can kind of follow, looks like this. If you're in the 20s, 20 to 25, you have normal weight, start getting above this, you start getting slightly overweight, and then you have obese. So I looked up some statistics, and these statistics uh, came out in 2010. So they're a little old, so the probably numbers have probably gone up a little bit. But 68% of adults in the U.S. are overweight. 33% are slightly or moderately overweight, 35 are obese, and 18% of children are overweight or obese. This number has changed dramatically over the past 30 years. Um, it, this, uh, these statistics uh, can change depending on ethnic groups. I would suggest you go to the CDC and look around. They have a whole, they have a whole web page dedicated to this. 98% of dieters regain all the weight they manage to lose plus 10 extra pounds within five years. That comes from the CDC, that's the study. Those are those crash diets I was talking about. Very unhealthy. Weight loss should be slow. Allow your body to adjust. But people don't like that. Nobody wants, nobody's going to tell you to, to, to go and lose weight slowly. They want to sell you stuff that makes you lose weight quickly, but that doesn't work. So this is 2009, 2010. These are some obesity rates of, of a BMI over 30. These are really pretty big numbers, 30% and higher. Okay. 16.9% of children are obese in the U.S. These are these kinds of numbers. These are children with BMI scores over 30. These are pretty high numbers. Boys more than girls, but we're still getting up into 15 to 20%. This is, uh, this is looking at that change over time, that increase. 5% in the 1970s, 15%. That's tripling, tripling obesity rates. What goes with... Uh, obesity, a lot of things. There's a lot of health problems. Let's talk about one, diabetes. Now, diabetes is a problem with insulin. And there's type 1 diabetes, which sometimes is called juvenile onset. I think it's just called type 1 now. And this is a problem in the pancreas. This is an autoimmune destruction of cells in the pancreas. And this is a lower number, 10 to 15 percent, has a strong genetic component. But these people are typically skinny, and they're having to take insulin, insulin pumps, um, insulin injections. The more common kind is called type 2 diabetes. It also has a genetic component. Sometimes it's referred to as adult onset. But we're starting to see type 2 diabetes in younger and younger people because it is not necessarily a destruction of the pancreas cells, but it is an insulin resistance. Insulin isn't doing its job like it, it used to.
This can be corrected oftentimes with diet and exercise and those kinds of things because it's really correlated with heavier weight. It's correlated with smoking um, and uh, it's a little bit higher in some ethnic groups. It has genetic components, those kinds of things. And um, it's linked to heart disease and uh, it has really, really grown in the United States, especially type 2 diabetes. So if you look at this map, this is the adults with diagnosed with diabetes. This map matches the same obesity kind of map. It's very dense in here. This is kind of an interesting other component. This is number of tweets about diabetes, but it is a really growing trend. It is growing lock and step with the obesity increase in the United States. Diabetes is a very dangerous thing. Um, it, it, it causes a lot of problems when you aren't regulating your sugar levels. Now, people with type 2 diabetes oftentimes have to take insulin if they're not managing it uh, correctly, but it does a lot. It can do a lot of damage if things get out of balance, damage to nerves, damage to, to retinas, uh, a lot of uh, problems with that. So here is diabetes in 1984, 14%, less than 14% in blue. Look, we're just going to go up 10, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Look at that in tr tremendous increase. We are not the only country in the world that deals with obesity issues. Okay, um, Worldwide, it is a growing factor. Um, and with um, increase in, in obesity, we get this increase in diabetes um, in many other countries. OK, um, so in, especially in developing countries where they don't have the, the medical um, support, you know, this is um, uh, the number of people with diabetes expect to increase from 84 million to 228 million in the, in, in the next uh, 10, 15 years. It's amazing how much it's going to increase. OK, this is just looking at different countries and the obesity and underweight. And you can see this incredible increase in obesity in many of these other countries. Mexico has really moved up quite a bit um, in past years. So hunger, eating, and obesity, we've just touched upon the topic. We've just looked a little bit in the brain, but this is an extremely important field. If you're doing your job well as a psychologist, let's say you are in an applied field, working with kids, working with adults, and you can do more for the health of that individual than even their doctor because you can teach them how to change and modify their behavior that might affect the, how much they're exercising, how much they're eating, and what they're eating. We know that what people eat have a, has a lot to do with their behavior. And there's a really growing field of health psychology that really is a marriage of issues of nutrition and exercise and food and, and proper behavior for health and the field of psychology.